Um, and so with that, I will just launch us right into this. We don't need so much housekeeping these days. We all know how uh, the, Zoom, uh, the Zoom room works. Um, so I am so pleased that we're joined um, by Robbie Kelman Baxter. Um, this is a woman that I could personally listen to all day long. Um, really, really wonderful ideas um, because she's here to discuss how to build subscription products that are so compelling that your customers never want to leave them. So Robbie has a really fantastic background. She's the founder of Peninsula Strategies, which is a strategic consulting agency. So she gets to spend tons of time really digging through with different organizations to develop and optimize membership models and subscription pricing that really works. So this means that she has a wonderful bird's eye view as well as really deep expertise um, in those kinds of businesses, right? And she wrote the book on membership economies. And I'm making a little joke here because she <laughs> wrote the book. Uh, Robbie is also the best-selling author of The Membership Economy and her new work, The Forever Transaction. So we get the opportunity to chat with her a little bit. We're thrilled to have her here today. Um, and she's going to talk a little bit about where her work in the membership economy began and how things have changed as we move towards the forever transaction. And we're also going to cover what you can do to make sure that you have a winning subscription, right? Which is something that we're all um, can get really excited about. So without uh, further ado, you're not here to hear me. You want to hear Robbie. So I am thrilled to pass it over to her. Thank you very much. I am so happy to be here and to be talking with all of you um, about how to build the products that people wanna join and want to stay with forever. And that's really what we're gonna to do today. And we're gonna get into the nitty gritty. Um, I've divided the, the talk into three parts. Um, first, we're gonna just get our, our grounding in terms of what's going on right now with subscriptions and what that means for us in designing and building product experiences. Um, and then I'm gonna talk about specifically where each of you are, help you figure out where you are on the journey um, to building a successful subscription model. And then finally, we're gonna go into a bunch of how to's and best practices so that when you leave this uh, conversation in about an hour, uh, you'll have some very tactical things that you can bring to your team right away. So let's dive in um, and we'll have time between each of those modules for, for questions. So as you go, as we go, you know, please feel free to ask questions or make comments into the chat and we'll try to incorporate those as we go. And then we'll also have time at the very end uh, for additional questions. I find that people kind of get warmed up as we go through and by the end, there's lots and lots of, uh, of questions and comments and, and um, I wanna make sure that we leave time for all of that. So, you know, I've been doing subscription work for the last 20 years. Uh, I started working with Netflix um, uh, many, many years ago when they had just kind of established their national footprint in the United States. They hadn't gone international yet. It was still 3D DVDs out at the time. And I fell in love with this model, this relentless focus on doing one thing really well for a customer to help them achieve a goal, to solve a problem. In the case of Netflix, that was, you know, professionally created catalog of content delivered in the most efficient way possible with cost certainty. Um, and I love that that's all that they did and they did it every single day and people subscribed and stayed and stayed and stayed. And I saw all these pieces in the model. And um, as I was falling in love with that model, other people were as well. And people started to say, hey, we wanna be the Netflix of news or music or bicycles or pain management for dentistry or you know, kind of you name it, somebody was experimenting at the time. Um, but when I tried to explain that proactively to like the person sitting next to me on the airplane seat or what have you, they'd be like, huh, I don't really understand. Subscription could work for anyone. Um, this, this is a massive transformative trend. I don't think that that really works in my business. So. You know, that's where we were even five years ago, where, where a lot of organizations weren't really sure about subscriptions or didn't think it was applicable or worth investing in. Um, but as all of you know, you know, five years later, um, every kind of business is working on subscription. So, you know, five years ago, I wrote the membership economy to explain what this massive transformation was. And today, you know, this year I put out a new book, The Forever Transaction, to talk about how to do it. What are the specific tactics 
in building a subscription model that people don't want to leave. Um, and so it is a lot trickier than it looks, as I'm sure you know, if you've been building in this space. A uh, couple of terms. Uh, membership economy is a term that I came up with to describe all of these organizations that were moving from ownership to access, from an emphasis on the anonymous transaction to a known relationship from single one-time payments to lots of smaller payments on an ongoing basis, and from one-way communication where I speak through my loudspeaker and I hope that you are listening to not just two-way communication where you know I'm talking and then you're talking and we're having a conversation, but also community conversation under the umbrella of the organization, which creates more value for each member. And all of these things together gave a business creators a new like almost like a painter's palette to rethink the business model um, and i called it membership economy not subscription and the reason was that i felt like it was all about the mindset the member mindset that the organization feels toward the people that they serve and i felt like if you have that then you can justify subscription pricing and if you don't have a member mindset then it doesn't matter how you price your products, you're not gonna be able to generate that kind of engagement and loyalty that justifies subscription revenue. Um, at the heart of all of this is something that I call a forever transaction. Um, and the forever transaction is, you know that moment when you take off your consumer hat and you put on a member hat and you're like, I'm not gonna look for alternatives. This is how I'm gonna solve my problems. Like, Thank goodness that I found, you know, a doctor I trust or um, this, you know, I'm going to just use Netflix and whatever content they have. That's where I'm going to look for something to watch at the end of a long day. Um, it's when the customer stops looking for alternatives and says, I'm going to go to you first. This is my gym. This is how I get and stay fit. You need to have a promise, what I call a forever promise um, at the heart of that which is really the very, very core of everything I do and where every subscription starts. It's what is the promise that you're making to your customers that justifies their ongoing loyalty? Um, one of the things that we'll see is that subscriptions are everywhere, but not everybody has a forever transaction. Um, when I was writing my books, uh, these, you know, take a look at all of these logos. I looked at every one of these business models uh, when I was writing my books to understand how, you know, how they were designing their subscriptions or their memberships, whether or not they had a forever promise at the heart of it, or whether they were just kind of bundling together a bunch of features and slapping a subscription price on it. And what's important for you to think about, you know, product people often get very, very focused on, you know, these are the people I'm serving, these are the features, this is the data I'm tracking, and so on. And sometimes it's just helpful to remember the situation that we're all in right now. Every kind of company, not just tech companies, um, not just content companies, every, you know, consumer products, retail, um, even, you know, Burger King is doing subscriptions right now. Uh, durable goods, uh, heavy equipment, Peloton, Caterpillar, um, everybody is thinking about subscriptions. And so when somebody comes to your subscription, they may have just been using one of these other subscriptions recently and may have had a good or bad experience. If they've had a good experience, they might come to you and say, you know, how come your onboarding experience isn't like Amazon? Or how come you don't recognize me like LinkedIn? Or how come you know, your experience isn't as smooth as Netflix or your variety isn't as great. Um, you know, the fact that it's everywhere makes consumers and business customers uh, have certain expectations for what a subscription should be. So it's just important to remember that we're in an environment right now where everybody's doing it. Uh, new world, new challenges. You know, the good news is consumers understand it. You know, businesses are very comfortable subscribing. You know, software as a service is core and understood. I remember working, you know, 10, 15 years ago with SaaS businesses. And one of our big challenges was certain companies wouldn't buy it. They just, they didn't, they didn't trust it. 
Um, they worried about, about privacy. They worried about security. Their IT teams uh, were fighting against it and felt like, you know, they didn't want SaaS, you know, to, to be part of their uh, tech stacks. Um, today, that's not the case. Today, the good news is it's customers are ready to buy your subscriptions. It's also globally acceptable. So customers in in India, in Europe, in Latin America, in Asia, are all both buying subscriptions, subscribing to services, and also building their own services. The other good news is that there's a lot of resources if you're designing a subscription. So 10, 15 years ago, you know, 20 years ago when I worked with Netflix, you had to build everything from scratch. You had to build out your own billing system. You had to think through your own user experience. You had to think through how do we support customers differently in a subscription world? Um, today, all of those use cases have off-the-shelf solutions, um, often subscriptions themselves, really easy to buy, really easy to implement. And there's tons of experts and uh, case studies that are available. Uh, so that makes it really, you know, in some ways is easier than ever before for you to take your vision and make it into a reality. The, the bad news uh, is that uh, everybody's doing it and it's ubiquitous and it's available to everyone. And so consumers, um, businesses, they're weary. Uh, they're tired of subscriptions and they're picky. And they're asking you, you know, why don't you do it this way? And I'm used to seeing it that way. And why are you forcing me to buy a subscription when, you know, or to subscribe when all I want to do is, you know, pay for my usage or pay to own it outright? So there's a lot of pent up resentment around subscriptions. So even if you're, you know, somebody who's just starting with a great and highly ethical subscription and you're just getting ready to launch it, you need to be prepared that your audience might respond or you might get the response from your audience that you don't deserve, but it's coming from their experiences with other not very good subscriptions. So, you know, you need to really be thinking about how you win in this world, in this kind of situation, in a world of subscription fatigue. Uh, three real causes for subscription fatigue. I'm sure nobody here is doing any of those, but other organizations, I've, I've seen these issues. The first one is lack of product market fit. And one of the things that people sometimes forget with subscription is that product market fit isn't just about getting them to the moment of transaction where the prospective buyer looks at your offer and says, that's exactly what I need. I'm going to sign up. You also have to engage them, sometimes expand the relationship, and of course, save the relationship. Keep them coming back. Make your products and services into habits. It's about what we're offering and what they want now and also for the long term. And what I see instead in a lot of cases is one, too much focus on the headline benefit. That's the benefit or the feature that gets people to sign up and not enough focus on the engagement features that make it a habit or the retention features that make people not want to leave. Um, the other thing that I see is organizations taking all of the features or benefits that they have kind of lying around the organization. You know, we have this, we have this bundle of content, we know how to do this. Let's just bundle it all together and call that a subscription, even if those features don't really fit the needs of our best customer. Um, it's just a bunch of stuff, and we hope that somewhere in the mess of things that we're offering, they find what they want. That's kind of the first problem. Second problem is subscription overwhelm, which is like there's so much stuff, and I'm not using it, and so I feel bad about myself because I'm not using this thing that I'm paying for, so I'm going to cancel. So what's different about this is that it, the, the customer in this case rarely blames the company, they blame themselves. This is like the New Yorker problem, the New Yorker magazine, right? This is a great magazine, so much great content, but this, the magazines are piling up and I'm not keeping up because I'm not a very good reader and I'm too lazy and I'm always watching Netflix and chilling, so I'm a bad person, so I'm gonna cancel my, Net, my New Yorker subscription. So like all the way through there, the company doesn't feel like they have a problem until the very end when they say, and so I'm gonna cancel. So that's the second reason for subscription fatigue is like, I am not a good person because I'm not using this product well, and it makes me feel bad for myself. I can't even keep track. And then the third one is the easiest to fix, but often the one that companies are most reluctant to fix. And that's hiding the cancel button, making it hard to cancel. Netflix just did the opposite. They actually said, we're going to cancel automatically for you if you have been subscribing for a year or longer without logging in. 
uh, because we don't want zombie revenue. But a lot of organizations have a mantra of let sleeping dogs lie. In other words, even if they're not using the product, let's enjoy all of this revenue that we get from people who aren't using our product. Um, and let's make it really hard for them to get out of this relationship. Uh, they Maybe they could sign up digitally, but if they want to cancel, they have to call us. And they have to call us on Tuesday between four and six and they have to bring their firstborn child. Um, and if they don't have children, they can't cancel. You know, it's like, let's make it really, really hard for people to cancel. So I'm very anti hiding the cancel button. Um, in order for you to beat subscription fatigue, you have to live by that forever promise that I mentioned earlier. Um, it's the long-term promise you are making to your best members. Um, who are the people that you are serving? You have to know who you're not. You know, in the case of Burger King, they're providing you know, unlimited coffee for five bucks a month. It's not for the coffee connoisseur. They don't feel bad if somebody says this is not the finest blend of coffee because that's not what they're trying to do. They're trying to provide good enough coffee at a very fair price in a very convenient way for a certain kind of person. So knowing who you're making your promise to, as long as you need this, I will help you achieve it in the easiest and most efficient way possible. So I'd love for you to be thinking about what your forever promise is for your subscription. Um, before I go on to module two, I would love to see if there are any questions. Uh, I encourage folks to pop their questions for Robbie about this so far into the chats. Um, while you are doing that and thinking of some questions you might like to ask her, I have a question of my own. And you know, you you mentioned ethical subscription, Robbie. And then I think, you know, also I'm sure everybody here, you know, has some frustrated emotion about not being able to find the cancel button as well. And, um, you know, I wanted to ask you, what about memberships and subscriptions that don't hide the cancel button, um, but they find some really creative ways to make hitting that button really painful for the consumer. So a couple examples are, you know, I know how to cancel my Facebook account, but I use that account to log in to, to 10 to 15 other systems and accounts. So I, I never do because there's a large cost for me. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing that's top of mind for me, because um, I'm, I am currently frustrated about it, is that the standard kitchen range is 32 inches wide. The range <laughs> in kitchen is 31 inches wide. And that means that, yeah, I know how to unhook it. I can unplug it and move it out. But if I want to do that, um, I am your going kitchen. To, I'm going to have to replace it with their brand of range or destroy my countertops and redo the whole thing, right? So they're they're kind of trapping me even though I can see the way out. So I'm wondering from you, is this just as bad as making the cancel button hard to find? Is it worse? Is it an unethical subscription um, to my kitchen stove? Um, or is this is this kind of intelligent buy-in? Is this a good strategy? What are your thoughts? Yeah, it's such a good question. I think we know the answer from your highly emotional description. Uh, I love that. Um, you know, you, that is, to me, that is exactly what hiding the cancel button is or making it hard to cancel, not because you love the product so much and you're like, well, I'm getting a lot of value from it, but because they have kind of put something into the product that you didn't realize was going to make it hard to leave, even though you want to leave. It's like handcuffs as opposed to a magnet. And it can work, but it works at a cost because whatever the brand of your kitchen range is, I'm sure you're never going to buy that brand again. I'm sure that you're going to not trust them and be like, oh, I'm sure they're, they're going to get me in some way other than I love my stove so much I don't want to get rid of it. And so when you're putting in those, you know, almost like poison pills um, mm -hmm. that make it hard, you know, you, you try to cancel and all these other problems pop up, you run the risk of damaging your long-term brand you run the risk of losing any kind of positive word of mouth and potentially having negative word of mouth and you lose the ability to win them back. So, you know, a lot of businesses are actually moving to a pause button. That's a feature right now that's very popular and becoming standard mm -hmm. um, to actually make it really easy for people to cancel without um, any repercussions. Yeah. Great, a great answer, um, and I, I totally agree with you. Um, we have one question um, from someone on the line. John wants to know if you see any cases where that forever promise changes as the user base grows and develops and matures, um, which I think is a really interesting question. 
Yeah, I, I do see it change. Um, I think that the most elegant forever promises can last for, you know, honestly forever because it's about the prop. It's about a human need or a corporate need. So for example, you know, Netflix is, I, I've been, I don't have Netflix on the brain this morning. Um, but, you know, their promise hasn't changed. We want great content delivered with cost certainty in the most efficient way possible. Um, 15 years ago, that was three DVDs out at a time and someone else's content on those discs. Um, and, it, you know, today it's through streaming and it's Netflix proprietary content. But the problem that we as, you know, consumers have is the same problem that they're still solving. So in some ways, you know, newspapers, same thing. You know, it's about understanding the world around me so that I can more confidently make decisions. That's most newspapers forever promise. Um, and then it kind of focuses in on a particular audience um, and the audience can change over time. You know, you can expand and say, you know, we used to, you know, uh, Amazon used to just serve people who wanted to buy books. Uh, today they serve everybody and they used to be regional, now they're global. Um, so you can expand who you serve and you can expand how you deliver. But I think that, you know, in many, in most cases, the promise itself stays pretty constant. Awesome. Uh, we do have a number of other questions for you here, Robbie. Um, they touch a lot on um, the freemium model as well as bundles versus a la carte and pricing questions. Um, for folks that ask those questions, I'm going to hold on those because um, we'll touch on that a little bit as we go further into the conversation. So um, for now, um, we'll put those uh, to the side and um, we, can, we can move into module two, Robbie. Awesome. Okay, here we go. Module two. <laughs> um, okay, so these are the, you know, mo module one was like, this is the big world. Now we're kind of focusing in on your business. And I want you to think about which one of these best describes where you are. And if you could be so kind as to put the word into the chat, launch, scale, or lead um, in terms of where your energy as a product person is going right now. Um, so phase, stage one is launch. Um, and this is where you're trying to get your product market fit, or maybe you haven't even gotten there. You're trying to convince either your company or your investors to give you the resources you need, money and time, uh, those two resources, to get your model up and running and prove the concept out. Um, and the challenge with subscriptions, of course, is, um, you know, it's not enough to just get someone to buy it. You have to also prove that they're going to stay and engage. And in some cases that the relationship will expand over time or lead to other places. Sometimes that subscription is being used for marketing. Uh, in other words, you know, it's an inexpensive way in uh, for people to get to know your organization before they buy the big expensive transactional product. Sometimes it's the product itself. All you've got is the subscription. Like a blue apron, all they have is their subscription, um, and that's the way that they make money. But for, let's say, Disney or Apple, their subscription is a tiny, tiny part of their overall business model, and it's just a way to bring people in or a way to deepen the relationship. So figuring out what the role of your subscription is, figuring out who you're making your promise to, figuring out product market fit. Um, that's all kind of what I think of as launch challenges. Like you don't want to start expanding until you figure this stuff out. So, you know, right launch if you're a launch person. Um, scale is the second phase, which is um, you've figured out your product market fit and you're trying to uh, transform the whole organization. You're trying to grow really fast. So this is where you're thinking about culture. Um, you know, culture eats strategy for breakfast. You might have a great model, but your colleagues might not be excited <laughs> to move from transactional to subscription, or they might not understand why you're doing it, or they might be worried about their own jobs um, and their own power in the organization. So changing the culture, changing the metrics from, let's say, quarterly numbers to lifetime customer value, or, you know, focusing increasingly on unit economics rather than, you know, kind of uh, aggregated uh, revenue numbers, thinking about ARR and MRR, things like that. This is all during the scale scaling phase. It's also a time when you're continuing to evolve the operating, you're, the offering you're expanding to become more relevant to a broader audience. And you might even be dealing with acquisitions to grow more quickly. So that's the scale phase. The last phase is lead. Um, and, and lead is 
you know, lots of organizations that I see in the lead phase um, have been around for 50 years, 100 years or more. These are um, associations, news organizations, fitness clubs, uh, you know, sports organizations, fan clubs. They've been around for a long time. They have a really strong member mindset. They're very focused on long-term relationships, but they often are myopic. They're, they're really focused on, you know, using their microscope to make small improvements for their existing subscribers. I think a lot of product, product managers um, sometimes get into the situation of, you know, like the granular improving of each little piece in the pie without kind of taking a step back, looking through your telescope and trying to figure out what's next on the horizon and listening to the orchestra instead of the violins, right? The violins are your current members. The orchestra is tomorrow's members and the people who canceled and the people who came by and checked out your offering and kind of cruised out before the end of the free trial. Um, so that's kind of the third, the third phase. And that's where what you're really trying to do is resist shortcuts to hit your quarterly numbers. Um, stay forever young, meaning you know, a lot of people say, you know, oh, our members, you know, young people don't want to join our organization. You know, people used to join, but now people aren't joining anymore, even though our current members love us so much. Why aren't we able to attract people anymore? I guess young people aren't joiners or young people aren't willing to pay for value. Um, those are the kinds of things that people say in the lead phase. When you're trying to continue to evolve, a lot of times the reason that people aren't joining even though some people are happily there is because the people who are happily there are not looking for alternatives. So they don't even know what's possible. They don't know that there are better solutions out there to achieve their forever goal. And um, the people who are looking in the window and trying to decide if they want to sign up for your offering um, are also looking into the other windows of the other options and you're not stacking up well. So in that case, the promise is still good, but the way you're delivering on the promise isn't keeping up with what other people want. So I see this a lot with, um, with news organizations, with professional societies, where, or with gyms, where it's like people aren't joiners anymore. They don't join gyms or they don't want to spend the $24.99 a month to be a member of our gym. When meanwhile, they're spending you know, $159 a month to be part of CrossFit because CrossFit is solving their problem better, better which is you know, the timeless challenge of I want to be get and stay healthy, and fit in the most efficient, fun, convenient way possible. So I'd be really interested to hear where you guys are falling in those three categories. Again, it's launch, scale, lead. I'll leave it up here for a second so that you can kind of think about it. Um, and, uh, and, and let me know where you, where you come out. It looks, Robbie, like there are um, a lot of folks primarily in scale and launch. Um, I only saw one lead in there. Um, although I also see some pre-launch, um, which is a which is a new category. Yeah. Uh, but one one question I have, and that others might be curious about, is: Do you ever find that organizations straddle these phases, or they bleed into one another? Uh, could you be in more than one at the same time? Yeah, it's it's a good question. You know, when I when I wrote the Forever Transaction, which is actually divided into these three parts: launch, scale, and lead. Um, I I really thought of them you know, when I was writing as more linear, but I see over and over again that companies are in multiple stages um, at, the, at the same time. So like an organization has been around a long time and now they're introducing a new offering and I'm on the team that's trying to figure out the new offering. So I'm back at launch. I'm trying to figure out the forever promise. I'm trying to make a case to get revenue, you know, you know, revenue accommodations that are different than those of the other, you know, P&L groups or what have you, or, um, I've been leading for a long time. We've had this organization, but we've just introduced a digital community and we're trying to use that to scale what we do. And so I'm thinking about technology and I'm thinking about infrastructure and I'm thinking about a different set of metrics than what we're used to. So absolutely. I mean, you, you can even look like Microsoft, you know, someone asked me, why is Microsoft in scale? Aren't they like, wouldn't they be in lead? They've been doing subscription for a long time. They're such a big company. But, you know, they're doing acquisitions, they're trying to blend in, you know, they've acquired, you know, over the past few years, LinkedIn and LinkedIn had acquired uh, lynda.com. Uh, and, you know, blending those, you know, I think Linda was the most membership oriented and then LinkedIn and then Microsoft. So you can see that, you know, cultural transformation can happen to even really big longtime organizations. So absolutely, 
you might be in, in, multiple, in multiple stages. And in terms of those of you that are pre, pre-launch, um, you know, I think of that as, as the launch phase. If you're definitely going to do something or you're definitely, I guess the only question is, are you really committed to doing something yet? Or are you really just deciding, does subscription make sense for us at all? Um, but these are really the, you know, getting the support, setting expectations, all of that needs to be done, um, setting the stage before you um, get into launch mode for sure. Yeah. Anything else or should I get into the nitty gritty that I know everybody is super eager for? I think that that is what they are anxiously waiting for. So let's give the people what they want. Let's give the people what they want. So this last module, I'm really going to get into some of the very specific tactics that you can take home with you and apply right away. Um, you know, at the center of everything, this is what I do when I'm working with an organization we try to find that is that has a going concern that already has a membership model or subscription, and we're trying to figure out where to make it stronger. This is where we start, and this is what we look at. So at the heart of it is product market fit. If, if I ask a company, do you know who your best member is? Do you understand what their journey is? And I always make the distinction between their journey and the subscription journey. Customer journey is not the same as a subscription journey um, in my way of thinking because the subscription journey is like, and then they touch our product here and then they hear about us here and then they come back here and then we do this and we do that. And it's all about us and our product. But for the customer, in many cases, your product might be a very small part of them achieving the goal that brought them to you in the first place. So it's really important to start with what is that customer journey? So if I buy this blouse to give a talk, right? The person selling it to me might want to really talk to me about all of its advantages and the fabric and its washability and, you know, the three quarter sleeves and what have you. I don't really care. All I want to know is, is it going to help me look appropriate for the talk I'm giving on Tuesday? Um, and if they dug a little further, they'd understand that the journey that I'm on is my speaking journey and my professional journey. And I just want to look professional for my work. And if they can help me on that journey, that's really where I'm going. It's not so much about the fabric or the sleeves. It's about how that works in service to the bigger goal that I'm on. And if they can tap into that and maybe even give me a subscription box that provides me with updated elements for my professional wardrobe, that's how they're really going to tap into the forever relationship with me and have not just product market fit to sell the one blouse, but to sell on an ongoing basis. So that's where we start. Um, and then we go from there and I'll just walk you quickly through these and I'm happy to take questions. I would love for you as you go through this to think about which of these is most applicable for you in terms of what you want to take with you um, from this talk. So the first one is, do you have the right organization for subscription? Um, are you structured in such a way that you're sharing the right metrics? For example, a retention metric should not belong to the retention team alone. Uh, if you acquire the wrong people, they're not likely to stay. If you bring people in because they want to watch Hamilton uh, and you pitch Hamilton and you say, join us and watch Hamilton for $6.99, there's a pretty good chance that they're going to cancel after the first month. And that's not just the fault of the retention or engagement team um, because they were brought in with, with the wrong expectations. So thinking about the right metrics um, and who owns those metrics and also having a culture where nobody is so focused on the short-term revenue goals that they can't think long-term about deepening the relationship. Second one is the funnel. And um, in the membership econ economy, that moment of transaction, you know, typical funnel is, you know, awareness, trial, transaction, go back and start over, right? Get another customer into the top. In the membership economy, you know, all of the real work um, and value happens at the moment of transaction. That's your starting line, not your finish line. Um, and you really want to optimize that before you start investing in acquisition. So that's kind of the second area for opportunity is understanding where in the funnel the biggest challenge is and optimizing there. Is it, it might be at that moment of transaction. The next one is pricing. I know there's a lot of questions about this. Um, I'll say a little bit, and I'm happy to answer questions. Uh, there are fantastic subscription billing platforms that allow you incredible flexibility to price and experiment in any way that you can dream up. You can price on usage. You can price with multiple tiers. You can price for you know an onboarding fee, a one-time fee. 
um, a hybrid, uh, different combinations for different people, bundles with other companies, bundles with your other products within your company. Um, there's lots and lots of ways to price. But the more complicated you make your pricing, the less your customer is going to trust you. And this is really simple. In a subscription model, your whole goal is to get the customer to relax into the relationship and say, I trust them that I'm paying a fair amount and I'm getting a lot of value in exchange on an ongoing basis. They're solving my problem. They're helping me achieve my goal. I don't need to think about it. If you start giving them too many choices, they're going to say, I need to become an expert on this pricing structure. Otherwise, I'm going to pay too much. And if I pay too much, I'm kind of getting cheated. So if this company is putting me in a situation where if I don't become an expert on their pricing, I'm going to get cheated, I'm not going to trust them. I'm going to keep my wits about me. So you really want, while it's, it's fine to have multiple offers, you want to remember that the more choice you give the customer and the, heart, and the more you expect them to figure out what they need from you instead of you recommending what you know will work for them, the harder it will be to build the loyalty. Um, freemium is, you know, I, I think of it as, you know, freemium versus free trial. Uh, a free trial is the taste of the most delicious thing you have to offer because the customer, the prospect doesn't know what it tastes like or doesn't believe it's as delicious as you say. So you're like, I have the most delicious filet mignon in the world. They say, I don't believe you. You say, have a taste. They say, you're exactly right. I'll buy three pounds. Um, that's what a free trial is for. Uh, my sister used to work at a frozen yogurt store. People would come in and say, can I try the vanilla? And after a while, she'd say, you know what? It tastes like vanilla. Either you like it or you don't like it, but I'm not going to give you a snack uh, for free. Um, the other reason that you give a free trial, especially in the world of technology, is if the customer truly doesn't understand what you're trying to describe. Um, and so you want to give them a taste of like, oh, I get it. I understand what you mean now. Freemium, on the other hand, is hamburger forever. If, if a free trial is a tiny taste of filet mignon, free, freemium is an ongoing subscription for free to real value. And you want to be really careful about when to do this and why you're doing it. And you want to be able to track the return on your investment. Are you doing it because you're changing behavior? You're demonstrating to that prospect that they're going to use your product more than they think they are. So this is what a lot of news organizations do. Um, this is what a lot of um, uh, software companies do where you, you bump up against these features and you keep bumping up against the paywall and you're like, oh, I actually am using this a lot. I actually am wanting that feature a lot. I guess I'll pay. I, I didn't realize I was going to use it as much as I do. Second reason is if there's a network effect, meaning that each person who's using your product for free is creating value for all the people who are paying. Um, so they are, in effect, part of the product. And the third one is if they are the marketing tool. So if there's a viral component, whether that's organic, meaning each person who joins brings in other people because that's how the product is used, like Hotmail, who you know was responsible for the concept of viral uh, viral marketing, or if it's organic where, you know, I'm an influencer and I tell people to join, that's a good reason to consider um, giving something away for free to somebody. Those are the only reasons to give something away for free. Um, if it's not one of those reasons, just put a price on it. Uh, putting prices on things is a great way to develop discipline to really see what people are willing to pay for. And while I'm a huge proponent of the value of free as part of your business model, it's not always needed. So be disciplined about it. Um, onboarding is uh, the first seconds, minutes, or days after somebody signs up for your offering. Uh, how are you curating their experience? How are you guiding them to both give them the value they want as quickly as possible um, with as little friction as possible and reinforcing the wisdom of their decision and showing them how to get more value, saying this is what our best customers do to get the most value. Um, and that's what you should do too. It's really important to make sure that your subscribers are getting a lot of value, getting the value that they pay for, because otherwise they're likely to cancel. If people aren't getting value they pay for, it may take a month, it may take a few months before they get around to it, but they'll cancel if they're not getting value. And that's why customer success is replacing customer support. Uh, customer support is waiting till something's broken and they call to complain, I don't understand, this didn't work, it's not working anymore, can you help me fix? Going from those kinds of conversations to 
you reaching out to your customers saying, welcome, how can we help you? Have you tried this? Did you know you're entitled to that? We want to make sure that you're getting the value that you're paying for and that you love the product. And if you have a subscription business and you want people to make a habit out of what you're doing, you have to build in that kind of approach um, at the very beginning of the relationship and also on an ongoing basis. This can be done, you know, if you're a B2B company, this can be done through, you know, actual human beings or customer success professionals who call and talk to your uh, subscribers. It can also be built in product. This kind of ongoing make sure that people are using the fees they're paying for, they know what they're entitled to, and they know the best ways to use the product to get the value they're entitled to. This is about saying if you're a streaming content company, hey, do you know how to connect the app on your little phone, your tiny phone, to your big screen TV? Let's make sure you do that so that you can get the enjoyment you're entitled to. And then finally, um, this is really important for those of you that work in traditional businesses. You know, everybody from, you know, restaurants to medical device companies to insurance companies now have product people, um, tech people who are thinking about the user experience and um, the companies themselves don't really have a strong history or culture of technology. So I always want to make sure that people think about what is the role of technology for the organization and that it's not just a supporting function, but it actually becomes a core customer thing and of any strategy. With those seven areas, um, I'm interested in kind of where people come out um, and where, what your next steps might be um, using your, your microscope uh, to look carefully at what you're doing today and also using your, your telescope at what's tomorrow. Um, so the secret to the forever transaction, if there's one thing I leave you with, it's that you have to love your customers and their mission more than your own team, your own business processes, and even your own fantastic products that you create. Um, thank you for the time. You can go to RobbieKilmanBaxter.com audience um, to get all kinds of goodies, the slides and the chapter excerpt and so on. Um, but for now, um, I'm really delighted to take uh, any questions and, uh, and thoughts. Lots of questions in here, Robbie, about um, when to use freemium, when not to use freemium. Um, and I think that you have answered those really wonderfully and succinctly um, in really thinking about how do I how do I know if that's the right thing for me to do. So, um, you know, I, I think that we often, I'm sure lots of people can relate to this, is that stakeholders and leadership teams, they, they love freemium. They know the word, it's stuck inside. <laughs> Um, they, they just really want it to be freemium because they know it is an effective strategy in some scenarios. So what I am curious about is what are those, what are those stakeholders missing when they're so focused on the freemium, right? What, what does it prevent them from paying attention to and, and which of these kinds of seven areas you just reviewed with us um, do you think tends to get overlooked or undervalued, right? So what are our secret MVs? Yeah, it's such a question. I had this one client and every time they had a board meeting, um, one of the board directors would say, hey, how come you guys aren't giving anything away for free? Free is the way to growth. Freemium is the way. We need to have a freemium offering. And this particular organization um, sold a, a very technical billing product to accountants. And we, we actually did a project that was called the free project, where all we did was look at every possible way to give stuff away. Free trial. Um, free accounts to certain kinds of influencers, uh, you know, freemium model. And what we realized, you know, kind of one by one is that none of that the problems that we were having with our model, you know, the, the reasons that people didn't want to, you know, weren't aware of us, the reason that people didn't give us a try, the reason people didn't engage, the reason people left, none of those had to do with the cost of the product. And that free any of them null core quality. They were like, you know, look, 40 bucks a month on, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars of business. It's like a non, it's a non-factor. We don't care. We would pay $80 if it worked. Our biggest issue with you is credibility. We don't know if it works. And the biggest hurdle for us 
is the onboarding process. We have to put all our data in there and we have to change our systems and that's really expensive for us. So it was just really valuable to get really specific about what is the job that freemium is gonna do for you? That's what I would ask that stakeholders. Like, what do you think we're gonna get from freemium? What is the problem that freemium is gonna solve? And you know, maybe even what evidence do you have that, it is, that, that that is a problem? Yes, yes, I, I love thinking about it that way. Um, and I think that that um, really touches on a lot of the, some, some of the specific questions that have come in in the chat earlier in the conversation as well. Uh, quickly, I do want to say um, now is a great time for you to pop additional questions um, for Robbie into the chat. Um, while you are adding those and thinking about that, um, there are some kind of uh, lighter questions in here. Yes, uh, the recording will be made available to everybody um, and I highly encourage you to go to Robbie's um, website where she has all sorts of goodies and downloads for the participants of this call. Um, tons of really generous stuff that'll help you um, connect to some of the resources around pricing and structure and all of those kinds of things. Um, Robbie, we also received a question if you're planning to record an audiobook of the forever transaction. Uh -huh. And I'm sure the person who asked that heard your wonderful speaking voice and knew that you would be a wonderful narrator. Um, so I'm, I'm curious to know if you're planning on doing that. Um, so it's actually out. Um, you can, you can't on all because my Hill's having some with audio. You can get it on Google Play. Um, you can buy it and download it um, outright. Uh, it's not my voice. Uh, I appreciate your kind words about my voice. And I do have a podcast. If you, if you want to hear more Robbie, uh, subscription stories, true tales from the trenches. I'll put the link in the, in the chat. Um, but yeah, the books, both books are available, uh, on audible. Uh, no, the first book is available on audible and both books are available in audio format. Awesome. Awesome. Fantastic. Um, so she's, she's ahead of us there. Um, and the URL was just dropped into the chat. So you can um, take a look at that um, and pop over there. Um, so we're also um, getting a lot of questions about validating a freemium product idea. And so to me, this um, is a little bit like a chicken and an egg, right? Because I, I know a lot of businesses, and I think this gets at exactly what you were talking about, Robbie, of um, it is anything, just subscribe, yes. Um, yes. right? And so how do you validate a freemium um, model versus a product that is going to serve your market? Where is, where is that line and how does that tension exist? Yeah, so what I, what I advise is, you know, in these, when you have these kinds of discussions, take a step back and really think about what is the role of subscription? To me, a subscription, it's like, it's like saying we need email. Like, yeah, you probably need email. It's probably going to be useful for you to have it. You can use it to send a communication to a colleague, a dash off a quick note. You can also use it as a marketing tool. You can also use it as a newsletter that people will pay a lot of money for your email newsletter. Um, but it by itself, email is not a strategy. It's a tactic. Same thing with subscription. Um, most organizations can benefit from building some kind of offer for a customer and have an on relation with you. Um, but the role that it does and who it serves is really up to you. And that's the strategy part. So is it, are you offering your freemium product as a way of introducing people to your offering? Are you offering that as a way of building a relationship with them so that they can buy the big transaction? Um, you know, what is, what is the role of freemium? Are you just trying to figure out usability and you're like, we're going to put it out for free for some beta period. And then we're going to put a paywall up once we know it works. But first we just want to see if people like it. Those are all good reasons, but you really have to get very specific about why you're giving something away and what role, how you're going to know if it's doing its job. Awesome. Awesome. Fantastic. Um, I cannot tell you how much I appreciate uh, all of your time that you've offered us, Robbie, and these really wonderful insights. I loved every bit of 
the conversation. Uh, I encourage everybody on the line uh, to take a look um, at Robbie's website and her podcast um, and go out and grab the Forever Transaction if you haven't gotten it already. Whether you want it in audiobook or if you want paper format, um, you have either option. Um, I will add very quickly. So I'm Georgina Donahue um, and I run the Pragmatic Alumni Community. Um, and so these conversations that we get to have with really incredible thought leaders like Robbie um, are brought to you by the Pragmatic Alumni Community. Um, so it's a spot uh, where Pragmatic Alumni um, really get tactical, right? We really talk about these ideas um, and how they translate into your unique reality. Um, and I'm super excited that Robbie is going to be our guest uh, in the Pragmatic Alumni Community in January. So um, we have members, um, member exclusive event in there. And so what we'll do is get the opportunity to talk to Robbie in a much more um, kind of intimate and, uh, you know, one-on-one -on -one setting um, where you'll be able to ask her questions about, hey, I have this specific scenario. Um, what do you think about it, given all of the best practices and, and the methodologies that we know to be true? Right. Um, so that's just one reason. Um, so come hang out with us. Um, I absolutely love seeing new faces and hearing new voices there. And then uh, if you liked this conversation and, and this kind of format works for you and you want to hang out with us again, uh, we have another conversation coming up on November 11th. Uh, and we are really going to be digging into win-loss analysis and decoding what no decisions uh, really means. So um, we'll be talking with Tim Rhodes and Natasha Naren. Uh, so please come on down and join us. Um, and with that, Robbie, thank you so much. This was fantastic. What a treat. Oh, it was treasure. It always is. Awesome. Uh, thank you, everyone, uh, for joining us. Um, really loved seeing all of your faces. I definitely noticed um, all of you with your cameras on. So kudos to you. And I hope that you have a wonderful rest of the day and rest of the week. <laughs>